afternoon from Singapore and Manila. Uh, I'm Vea Elisa Vega and I'm an Associate Counsel at the SIAC. And welcome to the latest installment of the SIAC webinar series. And today we have the Philippine webinar session where we will be discussing the strategies for seeking interim measures and in international arbitration. So we have participants who signed up from the Philippines, Singapore, India, Hong Kong, Australia, UK, US, among others. So since this is um, specific to um, Philippines for now, let me discuss a bit about the number of cases or Filipino parties we've had in SIAC. So in 2019, there were around 122 Filipino parties who were part of our uh, arbitration proceedings. So we see that there's a general rise in the trend for the need for international arbitration in the Philippines. But with our topic for today, which is um, interim measures in view of COVID-19, there's the community quarantine in the Philippines, which is similar to the circuit breaker in Singapore. And because of COVID-19, it has been affecting businesses and companies. So they may need, uh, companies may need some interim relief pending the resolution of their main disputes, such as maintaining the status quo, preserving assets, or preserving evidence of the subject matter in dispute. So I'm very fortunate to be the moderator for this afternoon session. And I have with me um, some esteemed panelists who are the top practitioners, some of the top practitioners in the Philippines and Singapore. And it's also good insight to learn or hear from them since I see that there's a lot of trend where Philippine contracts have governing law, which is the Philippine, which is Philippine law, but the seat of the arbitration is Singapore. So it's nice to see the interplay between the two um, governing rules of law or two types of law for international commercial arbitration cases. So now let me introduce our speakers. And I would like to thank them for taking the time to join us for the SAAC webinar. For this SAAC webinar. So first we have Mr. Bazul Asha. He's the managing partner and head of dispute resolution in Un and Bazul LLP. He specializes in commercial litigation, arbitration, mediation. He has acted in resolving cross-border disputes in, Asia, in the Asia Pacific region and he was awarded by Asian Legal Business as Singapore Managing Partner of the Year. He's ranked as one of the top lawyers in Singapore by Asian Business Law Journal, Legal 500, among others. Next, we have Mr. Don Mark Kalimon. He's a partner at Kesumbing Torres, member firm of the Baker McKenzie International. He heads the firm's dispute resolution practice group in industrials, manufacturing, transportation, industry group. With more than 19 years of experience in dispute resolution, he has acted as counsel and arbitrator in various domestic and international commercial arbitrations. He serves as chairperson person of the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators, and he's part of the panel of the SIAC, PDRCI, CIAC, Philippine Wholesale Electricity Spot Market, and is currently the Secretary General of the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution, or PICCR. Next, we have Mr. Philip J. Ratnam, SC. He's the Global Vice Chair and a CN CEO of Denton, Srodike, and Davidson, LLP. He's appointed as Senior Counsel in Singapore at an early age of 38. He's named as expert in arbitration, construction law, litigation. His international arbitration practice includes investments and projects in Asia and represented in proceedings in Singapore, Hong Kong, Zurich, Brunei, among others. Philippi Philip was president of Law Society of Singapore in 2004 to 2007, and he was also founding chairman of the Society of Construction Law in Singapore. Next, we have Louis Ogsimer. He's a partner at Romulo, Madbanta, Bonaventura, Sayoc, and De Los Angeles. He's the co-chair of the litigation and arbitration department, and he heads the firm's arbitration practice. Louis has handled commercial and investor state arbitration cases 
and institutions like the SIAC, ICSID, ECA, and had domestic arbitration in the PDRCI and the CIAC. He has also had several ad hoc cases under UNCITRAL rules. Louis has appeared and orally argued before all levels of the Philippine judicial system and quasi-judicial agencies and constitutional commissions. He's a member of the SIAC panel and he teaches international commercial arbitration and private international law at Ateneo Law School. Louis was actually my professor in law school, so just in case everyone wanted to know. Next is Ms. Patricia Ann T. Prodigalidad. She's a senior partner at Acra Law and specializes in commercial and construction arbitration, as well as commercial litigation. Though she acts as an advocate in international commercial and construction arbitration, Ms. Prodigalidad served as arbitrator and part of the panel of the SIAC, ICDR, CIAC, PICCR. She's also an accredited adjudicator and has published and lectured widely. She graduated from the University of the Philippines Bachelors, Bachelors of Law in 1996 with cum laude, and she ranked number one in the Philippine Bar, and she took her Master's of Law in Harvard Law School. So we really have a wonderful panel with us this afternoon, and I'm very thankful that you have this, you took the time to share your experiences and your expertise with us. So before we go to the panel discussion, let me do some housekeeping, um, housekeeping rules so the audience know, so the audience knows what they're in it for. So the webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube on the SIAC channel. So we're trying to make this panel discussion as interactive as possible. And there's a Q&A button and the panelists may wish to uh, the audience may wish to ask the panelists. We have limited time, but we're willing to, we're, we will try to go through as much question, as many questions as possible. So we can now start with our um, panel discussion. Then maybe we can first um, set out the background with regard to international arbitration during COVID-19, especially with the um, context in the Philippines. So maybe Don, Maybe you can give us a background on the current state trends in international arbitration cases in the Philippines during COVID-19. Thank you very much, Thea. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to, to speak with this wonderful panel. Um, <clears throat> thank you and uh, thank you to the SIAC for inviting us. Now, um, yeah, that's a... Uh, uh, good question, Thea, um, and but as everyone can appreciate, it's quite difficult to get complete information or statistics regarding um, arbitration, uh, primarily because of the confidentiality of arbitration proceedings. But having said that, let me share uh, what information I have uh, in relation to international arbitration in the Philippines. Uh, and, uh, I guess give my my views on its present state as well as the trends here in the Philippines with respect to international arbitration. So I think it's important to point out that the uh, arbitral institutions which are based in the Philippines are mainly the PDRC, Philippine Dispute Resolution Center, the uh, Construction Industry Arbitration Commission, and the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution, which is a uh, relatively new um, center. Um, it was set up only late last, uh, last year, or early last year. Um, now, I know that there are ongoing um, domestic and international arbitrations under PDRC rules. Um, I was not able to obtain the exact number, but I know that one, at least one, has recently um, gone through preliminary conference virtually. And I also know that there's one um, arbitration, um, although it's domestic, but it involves a multinational company, uh, which will be undergoing a virtual hearing uh, in the next week. Um, I, I happen to be a, a sitting as an arbitrator in that arbitration. Um, 
And I think as of last year, there were several um, ongoing arbitrations, and I'm sure it's still ongoing at this time, uh, many of which would have been affected by the pandemic. And I know that one of them involved an emergency arbitration proceeding. So it's quite um, um, pertinent to the uh, present um, session. And the, I think that was the first emergency arbitration proceeding under PDRC rules. Uh, the, the EA rules of PDRC took effect only in 2015. Now for CIAC, there are around 39, or actually there are 39 ongoing arbitrations, but all of them are um, domestic. Uh, but I understand that three of these arbitrations are uh, scheduled to have preliminary conferences via Zoom. And uh, based on a recent memorandum circular issued by the CIAC, five cases uh, had been disposed of, um, uh, final awards had been issued during the ECQ period. So as you can see, the CIAC is quite prolific, notwithstanding the pandemic. Um, and I think 22 of those 39 cases uh, are, are scheduled to be uh, heard on either preliminary conference or near experience. Now, PICCR, as I said, because it's a relatively young organization, um, there are no ongoing cases yet. Um, and uh, as far as I know, um, no, no uh, parties have, uh, there, there have been increased. Uh, about the PICC rules, but no uh, arbitrations have been commenced. Now, there are international arbitrations in other institutions, and perhaps with respect to SIAC, you might be in a better position to, to, to give some uh, uh, views, but I understand based on the SIAC website that there are at least two um, ongoing SIAC arbitrations involving Filipino parties. Um, it, it, I'm not sure if they have uh, intermeasures applications involved uh, in, in these proceedings. I think there are also some uh, arbitrations involving Philippine parties before or under the rules of the HKIAC and the ICC. Now, um, I guess that's the, that's the present state of um, international arbitration in the Philippines. Now, as to trends, um, all of these um, Philippine-based uh, centers, as well as I, I understand their international centers, have all been um, uh, embracing the present situation, the pandemic, and adjusting as needed. Uh, for example, the CIAC has issued, and it was the first organization in the Philippines to issue a uh, guide, guidelines on, a set of guidelines on virtual hearings. So it's in place and it's in effect. Uh, among the uh, unique features of these um, uh, guidelines is that uh, even if both parties refuse to participate, the tribunal can um, uh, take into account the circumstances and, circumstances, and of course, after consultation with the parties, um, consider the case submitted for this decision based on the submissions of the parties. Um, <clears throat> there are no extensions of the deadlines under the CIEC rules, notwithstanding the pandemic. Uh, of course, the parties are at liberty to apply. Um, the PICCR and the PDRC are in the process of uh, issuing or preparing their uh, virtual hearing guidelines. So both organizations are also um, uh, preparing for uh, uh, virtual hearings in the coming weeks or months uh, because of the pandemic. Um, now, the, based on my discussions with uh, arbitration users and practitioners, I think the general issues that are being considered are how to balance efficiency and uh, fairness uh, in the arbitration proceedings. I think that those are the two uh, important considerations in holding virtual hearings. So if I'm to summarize the, the trends here in the Philippines, uh, I would summarize it in three points. One, um, uh, although historically uh, there had not been that many international arbitration uh, cases in the Philippines. Um, the pandemic has further, I guess, disrupted the momentum that we've had uh, with respect to international arbitrations. Um, so a lot of number of the arbitrations that were ongoing before the pandemic, uh, uh, I'm sure has been de delayed because of the pandemic. But um, 
the second point that I would like to say is that I think there has been a general acceptance of the viability of virtual hearings in arbitration proceedings. And that is uh, exactly one um, aspect that uh, we take into account in the arbitration that I'm presently handling. Uh, uh, with the agreement of the parties, uh, we will be conducting virtual hearings in that arbitration. And uh, it's good to see that the users, the practitioners, and the centers who are operating in the Philippines are all recognizing the um, uh, advantages of using virtual hearings. And then finally, I think uh, even after this pandemic, uh, the use of virtual hearings will have its advantages in uh, promoting efficient arbitration proceedings. I think what, what this present pandemic is teaching us is that uh, we can find ways to make arbitration more accessible to uh, anywhere uh, in the Philippines. You don't have to have a physical location for the hearings. You can, you can conduct the entire arbitration proceedings online. And... Um, I think these past few months have been a learning experience for many arbitration uh, practitioners and users, and hopefully it will be a reason for people to embrace um, um, uh, technology as a means to make arbitration more efficient. So I hope that that leaves the, the general context clear. Thanks for the background, Don. So at least our view, at least our viewers now know what the situation is like in Manila. But in terms of SIAC, I'm actually handling a couple of Philippine cases. Um, so it's interesting that some arbitrations are still ongoing despite the pandemic. And there are also, I think last year, as I mentioned earlier, there were 122 parties from the Philippines who were, participated in SIAC proceedings. So we can see that generally there's a trend going upwards for international arbitration. And Don, you're right that we will be able to perhaps um, solidify the virtual means for easier access in doing arbitrations now, at, even after the pandemic. So next, uh, maybe we can um, ask Bazul on what the um, international arbitration trends are in Singapore during COVID-19, if he has any um, experience so far, Bazul. <laughs> now, I'm going to touch on uh, two aspects. One, Dawn has covered to some extent. It is virtual hearings, how they are assisting parties to get on with arbitration so that they can address the wrongs and have the commercial um, outcomes they seek to be given to them. The other is the type of cases which are coming before the tribunal um, during this COVID-19. Now the first, it is now becoming clearer that virtual arbitration is possible to be conducted in its entirety. It was the case that for EA arbitrations to be conducted virtually, now people are realizing that although it is not perfect, although as lawyers, as arbitrators, we want to see the demeanor of witnesses when we are cross-examining. Uh, we want to see how long they take. We want to avoid any risk that their evidence may be contaminated by someone coaching or they're reading something. But business has to go on. Life has to go on. There's no perfect solution. So virtual arbitrations are providing that solution in this difficult time for parties where everyone is locked down, people can't travel, but the businesses have to go on. Um, now I understand that Maxwell Chambers in Singapore has been offering virtual ADR hearing solutions. And which had been employed during the lockdown period quite successfully. In fact, uh, there was a, a hearing which was featured in the Global Arbitration Review in April, uh, where the Respondents' Council, based in London, was able to conduct a virtual hearing quite successfully, and the feedback has been very positive. And Philip uh, is the chairman of uh, Maxwell Chambers, and I'm, I'm sure he would be delighted and he would be able to speak on this further. 
Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect which I see parties employing is where possible conducting document only arbitration, where you don't undertake hearings, where you provide submissions before a tribunal, and the tribunal then reaches its award based on what is before the tribunal without having to hear parties. There you need the consent of the parties. The tribunal cannot unilaterally impose um, a document only arbitration. Given the pandemic, I am seeing parties more prepared to take this document only route, although it, there may be some compromise, but it's best to take it forward rather not to do anything. So that's, that's one. Uh, but in terms of virtual hearing, I hear what Dawn said, I hear what Tia said, whether that would be something going forward would, would be accepted as the norm. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not because I still believe that cross-examination requires the witness to be in front of you um, for you to hear, see and feel uh, in order for you to extract uh, what is required uh, from the witness so that the arbitrator can then decide. So I think we are still human uh, and we will remain so for a very long time. We are social creatures. And I think travel is very important. Once COVID is over, I don't think beyond emergency arbitration, we will have virtual hearings uh, for the entire arbitration. That's, that's, that's my view. I don't know whether I'm in the minority in this panel, but I thought I should put that view forward. The second is the type of cases which are coming before the uh, tribunal. Uh, given the COVID situation, there are parties who want to get out of their obligation, contractual obligation. So the usual route to get out would be to rely on a force majeure clause, clause in the contract and or relying on the concept of frustration, which is provided for under common law. Uh, I see these cases coming upfront more often these days. I won't engage into the details at this juncture of when you can rely on force majeure, when you can rely on uh, frustration. I'll, I'll leave it for discussion if it is a topic of interest for others. Thanks, Tia. Thanks, Bazul. So now, since we were able to um, give the background on the two jurisdictions with regard to COVID-19, maybe Louis can describe the need for interim relief given this pandemic situation, like with the community quarantine in the Philippines. So in what instances do you see um, interim relief being needed? Okay. Um, thanks, Aya. And, and thanks again for the, to SIEC for organizing this. Um, I, probably we should look at it uh, I'm approaching this from the perspective of international law and also from the perspective of uh, Philippine law. Um, first, we have to look at this COVID-19 situation as giving rise to a lot of issues uh, concerning force majeure, as Basul uh, already mentioned. Uh, and then on top of that, I think what is important for those who are listening to this, to this webinar is for them to understand the concept of arbitration. Arbitration, as I always tell, uh, and, and I'm sure Thea is so fed up with this, is a creature of contract. And therefore, um, for there to be an arbitration, there has to be an arbitration agreement. And that ar arbitration agreement is usually contained in, an, in a main contract. So during the COVID-19 situation, uh, I'm sure as, as most of the members of the panel have, have experienced, we've gotten a lot of inquiries about force majeure, about material adverse um, clauses, um, termination for convenience, change in law clauses. These are things that you have to look at when it comes to this particular situation that we have now. Uh, specifically for the Philippines, there was a law that was passed by Congress, which is the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, which really contains a lot of uh, provisions that some say 
um, effectively impair some of the contractual obligations. But uh, of course, from the perspective of Philippine law, um, we know that uh, the force majeure issue is something that is seen in uh, Article 1174 of the Civil Code. And there are, uh, force majeure is essentially, which is the same for most jurisdictions all over the world, is that it is an event that is um, unforeseen, or even if it is foreseen, it is something that is inevitable. But at least in so far as Philippine law is concerned, there are three instances where a party is not excused by a force majeure, uh, such as most people would call uh, COVID-19 as a force majeure event. Those three instances are, one is if, if the parties have expressly stipulated uh, that they will not be excused by force majeure. Second is if there is a law that, that specifically says that a party or the parties will not be excused by force majeure. And of course, the third one is where the, the nature of the obligation is such that it requires the assumption of risk. So that's essentially, um, those are the issues that come to fore because of this COVID-19 situation. And we have seen instances, and I'm sure uh, the lawyers also in, in this webinar would have gotten queries about clients asking, how can they be excused from their performance of their obligation because of the community quarantines that are being imposed not only in the Philippines, but also all over the world. Um, an example I have is in, in, a, uh, in a query I got is that there is a distribution in the Philippines where the goods are being manufactured in three different areas, one in India, one in uh, the UK, and one in China. So you do not, it has become a global issue such that um, you just do not look at how does this impact the Philippines, but how does the lockdown in other parts of the world apply to a Philippine party's obligation to comply with its obligation in a globalized or multi-jurisdictional transaction? And when a party either wants to compel performance or wants to be excused from performance because of the COVID-19 situation, then that is where interim measures uh, come in. And I guess when, when we look at interim measures, again, we look at it from the perspective of um, how are interim measures viewed on an international sphere and how are interim measures viewed within the Philippine uh, law perspective. Um, the Philippines is a signatory to, oh, sorry, the Philippines has adopted the Uncentral Model Law in its entirety. It was made an annex uh, under Republic Act 9285 or the ADR Act of 2004. And it was expressly made to govern international commercial arbitration. So for purposes of, of this afternoon's discussion, I'd like to focus on international commercial arbitration. So when you look at the Uncentral Model Law, it actually contains... A, at least the 1985 version, provides for a general concept of interim measures. But if you look at the 2006 amendment, particularly in Article, I think it was in Article 17, mm -hmm. um, it actually defines what an interim measure is. And this is a good guide for those who are contemplating interim measures. And when you look at the definition under Article 17, there are three things that are the main uh, characteristics of an interim measure. One, it is temporary. It's a temporary measure. It is not supposed to be there uh, for a long time. Um, second, there is a requirement as to form. So it can be the form of the award. It can either be an order or an award. In fact, if you look at the SIAC rules, um, it says that it can either be in an order or in an award. The, the Uncitral Model Law does not actually, it's, it just says in an award or any other form. Uh, why is that material? Because some institutions actually require scrutiny by the arbitral institution with respect to award. But with respect to the SIAC, whether it be issued in the form of an order or in the form of an award, the SIAC would still have the power or is required to scrutinize it as to form. The third aspect of uh, an interim measure under the Uncetral Model Law is that it, it can be applied for at any time prior to the issuance of an award which finally settles the dispute. In other words, the interim nature of the, of the award is in itself uh, provided for in Article 17. Now, as to what kinds of uh, interim measures one can apply for, uh, again, Article 17 is actually very helpful because it uh, gives us the general 
uh, types of interim measures one can apply for. First, it is an interim measure or order that, can, uh, that will help preserve or maintain the status quo or restore the status quo pending the termination of the dispute. The second type of interim measure is one which compels a party to take action or to prevent or refrain him from taking action that will be prejudicial to the uh, arbitral process. In other words, it can tend to render the arbitration process either moot or uh, useless. Uh, the third type of interim measure is a, a, a measure to provide means to, to preserve assets uh, in order to ensure that there will be sufficient assets to satisfy an award. And then the fourth type of measure is what we call the interim measure to preserve evidence. And we, when we speak of preserving evidence, these are evidence which are material or relevant to the resolution of, of the dispute. So what, what do we see in the trend uh, in this COVID-19? Uh, the most common ones are applications to, for example, prevent a party from uh, calling on a performance bond uh, or a security that was put up, particularly with respect to uh, construction contracts. Some would want to prevent the termination of a contract. Uh, so, so these are all types of interim measures uh, that, that uh, we, a party can apply for with the SIAC or with any arbitral institution. But what is important is that before you apply for one, you have to read your contract first. Because I have had contracts where the arbitration clause or the arbitration agreement or some provisions of the contract actually provide for a prohibition or an agreement by the parties that they will not apply for any interim measure with respect to certain aspects of the contract. So while all these things are provided in law, in jurisprudence, of course, arbitration being a creature of contract, the first thing you have to look for is, uh, is there a provision in your contract which actually limits your ability to apply for interim measures? So thank you for that, Louis, and thank you for discussing the force majority clauses. Because before, when COVID was starting in, in the world, and I was asking my colleagues actually on what force majority is in Singapore, because in the Philippines, it's embedded in almost all of our contracts in the civil code. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask my colleagues if it's a contractual thing or is it in, also in their civil code. So segueing to that, maybe Philip can describe to us what scenarios he sees with regard to interim measures in Singapore, as Louis already discussed um, some of his experiences in the Philippines. Would you want to share your experiences on inter seeking interim measures in Singapore? Uh, yes, uh, uh, certainly. Uh, the the um, I, I think we can consider it, you know, both generally as well as uh, under the current circumstances of uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis and uh, some of its implications and, and consequences. Uh, I think broadly speaking in general, interim measures uh, have been used uh, often and uh, effectively whenever you need to uh, preserve the subject matter of a dispute. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, interim measures have also uh, been used uh, in relation to uh, threatened terminations on occasion uh, or, and also um, uh, events within uh, organizations and corporations uh, which are thought to be in breach of some constitutional uh, provision. So there's a whole range of, of uh, um, uh, ways in which it has been used. Uh, specific to the preserving the merit, uh, either preserving property or preserving the status quo. And then uh, I think there's uh, the, the, the separate forms of interim measures where uh, one is seeking to avoid uh, dissipation of assets, to restrain dissipation of assets on the part of the uh, respondent, um, as well as some other forms of interim measures which seek uh, evidence um, or the preservation of uh, documents or other uh, for, uh, uh, repositories of, 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 of evidence. Um, in, in the COVID-19 uh, situation in, in, in Singapore, I, I think um, uh, they're actually, uh, well, one has to remember that um, the, the government has actually dealt with uh, a lot of the legal, immediate legal consequences of COVID-19. 
uh, through uh, legislation, COVID-19 temporary measures. Um, and so these have actually put into place, I mean, almost a kind of freeze in, in, in certain areas. I mean, for example, in, in construction. Um, and so that's kept a lot of these uh, potential disputes uh, out of the courts or out of arbitration um, with provisions as well for uh, assessment. So um, without lawyers being present, but legally, you typically legally trained assessors will give a, a, a quick or rough and ready uh, uh, um, uh, um, answer uh, to some of these issues. So I don't think we've seen a lot of uh, specifically COVID-19 related uh, seeking of interim measures at the very least. Uh, but I think there is definitely potential uh, and we will be seeing more disputes relating to uh, broader issues of uh, force majeure, frustration, uh, and, 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 and so on. And of course, um, uh, Singapore being a seat for uh, international and cross-border dispute resolution, um, there, there are, of course, projects, uh, 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 there are uh, arbitrations and indeed litigation relating to projects outside of Singapore where you may not have uh, legislative intervention. And so uh, one will be seeing uh, more, more of that as well. Um, so I think generally, uh, I think what, what Louis has said uh, applies broadly speaking uh, in, in the Singapore context. Thank you, Philip. And I agree that there's actually a lot of um, emergency arbitration cases going on at SAAC. And I think, um, as I told my the panelists yesterday, I'm actually in the middle of one now. And I'm sure my colleagues are also managing their um, emergency and relief cases. And it's not particularly just Singapore or Philippines, but you're, as Philip mentioned, there are some countries without legislation. Um, responding to COVID-19, that's why emergency interim relief is necessary in certain instances. So segueing to that, um, given that I described the sort of rise of um, emergency interim relief applications in the SIAC, maybe Ms. Trina can give us the advantages of EA proceedings as compared to national court applications for interim relief, specifically for international commercial arbitration. Thank you, Thea. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we have to consider whatever advantages people see in arbitration as a form of dispute resolution, this flow into and extend to EA or emergency arbitration proceedings. So uh, the benefits that you would typically talk about when you decide to go through arbitration would be confidentiality. Oftentimes, you don't want your dispute um, put into public records. Uh, since ADR arbitration is a private forum for your resolution of your dispute, it remains confidential. And under Philippine law, in fact, it is, um, the consequences are dire because it's legally mandated confidentiality in the Philippines, regardless of whether it's international commercial arbitration or domestic. Um, another advantage would be, um, of course, the swiftness within which resolutions and relief can be given. Um, although the Supreme Court has made it a point to promulgate rules that are summary in nature, to have expedited um, action on applications for inter -relief, interim relief by courts, there is still room for delay. And oftentimes, um, because of parties' various filings, which courts uh, just accept, uh, the resolution of the application tends to be slowed down. Especially at this time under COVID, it would be more feasible to actually apply for an emergency arbitrator with the SIAC than it would be to go to the national courts. Um, although we are on different levels of uh, community quarantine, you have to go to a specific court to ask for relief. You can't just go to the court that happens to be open. Under our rules, there's a certain venue provision that you have to go to if you want to apply for interim relief with the state courts. And if that happens to be on lockdown, in fact, just today we got an announcement that one of our courts in the city of Manila, that entire trial court has been put on complete lockdown. So because of the uncertainties of the court system and their uh, lack of familiarity with the 
electronic modes of transmission, virtual hearings for hearing applications, it would be more efficient to go through the SIAC process, apply for an EA, where the secretariat, like Thea, <laughs> is very quick and efficient in coming up and appointing an EA. Um, I guess the one of another advantage would be, although Louis mentioned the kind of relief that you can ask for in an arbitration proceeding, um, the courts under our Supreme Court rules can give a wide array of interim relief. But they happen to be pigeonholed, I think, because of their experience in litigation. They apply what they know in litigation to the application. So they, they will not be able to, um, may, not be more, may not be as familiar in coming up with relief that can really accommodate and address the needs of the parties. They will stick to the requirements of the provisional remedies that are stated in our rules, attachment, injunction, support, receivership. So th since they have that format in their minds, they are less likely to give relief that is unusual to them. And arbitration, as you know, uh, you, you, the arbitrators, emergency or otherwise, would give the relief in accordance to what is needed. Um, uh, another advantage, I suppose, would be unlike, and this is in no way demeaning any of the judges, um, you, you are not assured that the judge who will hear your application has the expertise needed to resolve the dispute that uh, is presented. So that um, a lot of arbitration cases involve complex issues, even if it's just an application for interim relief. And um, courts, although there are special courts to hear applications for interim relief, they don't have the same level of expertise as uh, an arbitrator would um, to address the particular issue that you have. And I guess one other uh, advantage is the potential reach across jurisdictions. Um, a national interim relief uh, issued by a court would be enforceable within the jurisdiction of the court or of the Philippines, as the case may be. But an award, if it is an emergency arbitrator award or uh, some form of interim relief given by the tribunal in an arbitration proceeding, the potential of having enforcement across jurisdictions, that is there. So if you think you need to be able to enforce your interim relief across jurisdictions, it would be better to uh, go through an application for an EA, then it would be to go to state court. Thank you, Ms. Lina. And since we're discussing about um, national court applications, maybe I can go to Bazool. And maybe Bazool can discuss if a party applies concurrently to a national court to seek similar or related interim relief, will, will, will there be any impact on the emergency arbitration proceeding, if any? In Singapore, the both the EA and the courts have power to order interim relief under the IAEA, International Arbitration Act. And the courts will only intervene in arbitral proceedings in very limited situations. Under Section 12A4, only in urgent cases may the court make such interim orders to preserve evidence assets in the proceedings. Where it is non-urgent, the courts may only act upon the application of a party to the arbitral proceedings and with the leave from the arbitral tribunal or written consent from the other parties. Look, this is because in Singapore follows a court subsidiary model where the court's power to grant interim relief is subsidiary to the arbitral powers to do the same. This may be contrasted to a free choice model followed by some countries, for example, India, where the parties can elect to apply to either the court or the tribunal for interim relief. Now, so in practical terms, as proceedings before the emergency arbitration, for example, I mean, if you want to apply for a freezing order and you want to get in on a very urgent basis to get a freezing order on an ex-party basis, short notice, give notice to the other party, but on a 
very urgent basis because you believe that there is likely to be dissipation, then it would make sense to apply to the courts. And where you also, maybe perceptively speaking, I think it's more than perception, where you need the bite of the court, the threat of a contempt proceedings to, com to have the party who's subject to the order to comply with the court order, then also you want to go to court to get the order from the court. So the impact as I see it is to facilitate arbitration. It's a positive impact, having the ability to go to court to get any reliefs, interim reliefs on an urgent basis. Uh, that's how I see it. Thanks very much, Bazul. And it's interesting to know on how the IAA specifically mentions the, interim, the uh, interplay between the arbitral tribunal's uh, interim relief and the court issued in interim reliefs. So maybe we can now go to the proceedings per se, then maybe Dawn can describe to us what should be the contents of an EA application and how detailed should the application be? Don? Okay, thanks again, Thea. Um, let me uh, discuss the, uh, both the contents as well as um, the question on how detailed it should be uh, together. And I think when we were uh, discussing earlier, um, you mentioned that you also wanted to uh, um, need to include any tips on um, crafting and training uh, the relief sought uh, from an emergency arbitrator. <clears throat> so I, I think the uh, uh, this uh, topic can be, uh, I guess, the, the message that I, I, I would want to uh, put across would be, uh, can be summarized into, into four four points. Um, of course, it this presupposes that you have decided that. Um, obtaining emergency uh, arbitration, uh, emergency relief is appropriate with respect to your case. So I agree with what Bazul said, that there are instances where it's actually more suitable to ask the court for um, interim measure because after all, um, emergency relief are essentially interim uh, measures of protection, except that they are more urgent and they cannot await the constitution of the tribunal. But assuming that based on your analysis, um, you need to obtain emergency relief from the EA, um, I'd say there are four uh, things that you need to watch out for. Uh, number one, uh, you have to review the re uh, arbitration agreement. Um, because the arbitration agreement, um, to a certain extent, will determine whether or not you do uh, uh, have the ability to um, seek emergency relief, and if so, sometimes the extent of the emergency relief that you can obtain uh, can be uh, determined under the arbitration agreement. Uh, for example, um, one, one example would be uh, when the arbitration agreement was signed or when the arbitration proceedings was commenced can be determinative of whether you have actually that ability. So I understand for SIAC, um, uh, arbitration clauses, then uh, under the uh, 2013 SIAC rules, which is I think the first time that uh, emergency arbitration was introduced, uh, the arbitration commenced after uh, I think April 1, 2013, then you, you can apply for um, emergency arbitration. And other institutions have similar provisions. Um, there are also rules uh, that um, allow parties to opt out of emergency arbitrations. So if your um, arbitration agreement provides for such opt-out, then you will not be able to um, commence um, emergency arbitration proceedings. Now, second point would be the arbitration rules that are applicable is also important to take into account. And this is where the contents of your uh, emergency arbitration um, application, as well as the relief that you seek, uh, would um, be determined. And uh, while generally all the arbitration institutions, all the, all the rules follow basically the same approach, uh, there are variations to, to these approaches. 
And I think this is one area where you, you will appreciate the simplicity of the SIA series. Like for example, with respect to the contents of the EA application, um, uh, under the SIAC rules, uh, there are only three requirements, like the relief sought, the nature of the relief sought, the reason why a party is entitled to that relief, and uh, proof that copy was uh, served or that efforts were taken to make sure that a copy was served on the other uh, on the, or the, the relevant parties. Um, other institutional rules have more requirements, but essentially I think these are uh, uh, the, the most important um, elements of an EA application. Uh, with respect to relief, there are also some differences. Uh, the SIEC uh, generally provides or broadly provides that um, interim emergency interim measures as the EA or the tribunal may deem appropriate. Uh, so that's, that's the general standard. Um, other institutional rules uh, provide for more details. Uh, like for example, here in the Philippines PDRC, uh, identify the type of um, reliefs that are available, uh, preservation of assets, um, provision of security, uh, and, and several other matters. So it's important to look at the arbitration rules. And then third, the arbitration law uh, um, applicable is also important um, because the arbitration law may limit also the extent of the EA um, relief that you may uh, obtain. Um, in the Philippines, we don't have uh, uh, emergency arbitration provisions in our law. So we, we were looking at uh, the possibility of revising uh, the Philippine arbitration law to include provisions on enforcement of emergency arbitration awards. But that process is still ongoing and I'm not sure whether we will be able to see any changes in the near future. Um, and I think this is the reason why PDRC, for example, um, included a, uh, an innovative provision in their rules where uh, emergency arbitral awards uh, will have the same form or will take the same form and will have the same effect as interim measures of protection. So because uh, Philippine arbitration law recognizes enforcement of interim measures, um, if, uh, if the parties have agreed that their EA uh, awards will be or orders will be considered as interim measures, then they should be enforceable um, under Philippine law as interim measures. Uh, that uh, issue is currently being tested uh, in, one, in one case in the Philippines. And then finally, the fourth point would be look at the place of enforcement. So it's also important to uh, take into account where are you going to enforce the arbitral award, uh, the, the emergency relief, uh, because it's also something that you need to take into account in crafting your um, EA application. And in some cases, it's not necessary um, to enforce uh, emergency relief because parties, uh, some parties would voluntarily comply with an EA award, but it doesn't happen all the time, so uh, better take that into account. So those are, at, at least, I think, four points that, uh, that should be considered in preparing EA applications. Thank you, Thanks. Thanks so much, Don. So since we discussed the um, contents of the application, maybe Louis can give us some tips for managing the deadlines or giving us the general process for an EA proceeding? Okay. Um, well, as probably most of the people participating already know, since it's an emergency arbitration proceeding, it is a really very expeditious process. And I think SIAC has one of the most expeditious EA processes uh, among most arbitral institutions. So one, one important requirement is, of course, for you to first check what are the rules provided in your um, in your uh, the arbitration rules of your chosen arbitral institution. For the SIAC, for example, um, it requires that you file your notice of arbitration and then concurrent with the filing of your notice of arbitration or immediately after, you can file an application for emergency relief. So it, please note that in some institutions, you can file it, but if you don't file your notice of arbitration within so many number of days, then your emergency relief can actually be um, dismissed or withdrawn. Uh, as, at least for the SIAC, it makes sure that you do not encounter that difficulty because you have to file your notice of arbitration first and then your application together with your notice or immediately after. And it's also a requirement that you send copies, as, as mentioned by Don, uh, to, to all the parties uh, who will be affected. It's, it's, I think, it's obviously part of the due process requirement. 
and make sure that uh, the requirements uh, uh, informed by Don on, on what should be contained in your application should be there. Um, another more important thing, uh, at least in so far as SIAC and the emergency arbitrator is concerned, is your payment of your administrative fees. Um, you are required to pay, I think for non-Singapore non parties, it's 5,000 Singapore dollars. Um, and uh, you are also required to remit uh, emergency arbitrators fees of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 30,000 Singapore dollars. And you are given a period by the registry or registrar to pay that. And it's very important that you pay that or remit that within time because if you don't, then the registrar has the right to consider your emergency arbitration application withdrawn. Um, and then from the payment, the president of the SIAC actually has uh, to appoint an emergency arbitrator within one day. It's, it's frankly one of the fastest uh, um, I've seen. And uh, so after the president appoints the emergency arbitrator, and just to give an example, um, I remember I was in, in, uh, on a vacation in Paris and uh, the SIAC registrar called me up if I'm willing to act as an emergency arbitrator. Of course, I said yes, but I told them that I was in Paris. And then they said, unfortunately, even if we can do uh, virtual hearings, the problem is the time zone. So, so that's how sensitive the SIAC is in so far as the requirements of the parties, because the parties, I think, were both in Singapore, or at least in the time zone of Singapore. Um, second, uh, so once the, the emergency arbitrator also, as, as with most arbitrators, you're required to make a statement of uh, impartiality. Um, so, so unless you're, the assumption is if you're qualified, then you can act as an emergency arbitrator. Uh, and the parties have, the, the other party has a right to challenge the appointment of an emergency arbitrator, but you have to do that within two days from being notified of the appointment of the emergency arbitrator. Um, and then from the appointment, the emergency arbitrator has only two days to schedule the process by which he or she will be conducting the emergency arbitration or the, the, uh, uh, how he will consider or she will consider the application for emergency relief. Um, and another very stringent requirement is that the emergency arbitrator has to issue his or her order or award within 14 days from his or her appointment. So again, which shows you how expeditious the, the process is. And uh, so, so the emergency arbitrator can conduct it either virtually or call in-person hearings, uh, most likely in a situation that we are now hearings will be done virtually because uh, to avoid any travel restrictions of the parties, the witnesses, and so on and so forth. Um, and you also have to understand that the, the effectivity of the emergency arbitration, uh, arbitrator's order or award, uh, it ceases to be binding on the parties uh, after 90 days from the issuance of the emergency arbitrator's order or award. So how do you now manage knowing that this is a, a very fast track process um, of course, if you're the, the claimant or the applicant, make sure that you've already done all your preparations. You actually have the edge in an emergency arbitration application. Line up all your witnesses. That most likely, the emergency arbitrator will limit the number of witnesses because of the, the, the extremely short period that he or she is given. Um, make sure that your submissions are already ready. And if you're on the side of the respondent, once you get that notice, uh, I mean, you, you would have already known that uh, a dispute is brewing and that's something most likely will be applied for. So, so that is also something that you have to consider. And I think to, to also dovetail with what Trina said, in so far as deciding whether to go to a local court or to go to an emergency arbitration uh, um, remedy uh, with, the, with the SIAC, you also have to understand that the facilities uh, for a virtual hearing, especially during this COVID-19 situation, um, I think SIAC would have a very very uh, big advantage there uh, because they know how to handle whereas for most courts while of course most courts are already now equipped uh, the rules of the supreme court were only issued uh, sometime in may just last month so some familiarity is being still uh, uh, made by judges on how to handle virtual hearings whereas in siac this is something that they're very familiar with so that's something i think I, those are just some of the tips uh, i'm aware of the time so i'll i'll end there uh, thanks, Louis, for summarizing the whole EA proceeding for the SIAC. And 
the crucial thing is actually the scrutiny part because the arbitrators or the EA should be able to take it into consideration with managing the schedule. For example, on 14 days, it's, the award should already be out. So they should take into consideration like one day or two for the SIAC registrar to scrutinize the order or the EA award. So since we mentioned, um, Louis mentioned the virtual hearings given the COVID-19 situation now, especially for EA proceedings, maybe Philip can give us some tips for advocacy for EA proceedings if he has any experience with regard to virtual hearings for EAs, for example, like what should the parties focus on? Uh, sure. Uh, well, you know, virtual hearings, I've, I've, I've been appearing in them both uh, as counsel as well as arbitrator, um, as well as counsel in court proceedings. So uh, I, I, I think there are a number of uh, things to, to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, um, in, in terms of the preparation and the presentation of, uh, of documents, I think it's, it's, it's very important to be uh, prepared as to what you really need to show to the decision maker uh, and to be able to make use of the technical facilities for, for sharing documents in the appropriate sequence or indeed using a PowerPoint presentation to go through, uh, of course, documents that have already been filed or possibly some demonstrative exhibits uh, but generally, as with all arbitration proceedings, you can't take your opponent by surprise. So it has to be something that's already uh, uh, been uh, uh, served or, or, or provided, but it can be organized in the form of your presentation. And I actually do think that virtual hearings can be, uh, can be very effective and can be in some ways uh, more effective than an in-person uh, hearing. Uh, because they become very focused and you're, you, as an arbitrator, you can really look at the advocate and as the advocate, uh, you are really just uh, focused sitting there and, um, and addressing, uh, in the case of an EA, a one-person arbitrator. Um, I, I have had experience where I've been addressing three people at the same time in, on a virtual hearing, and I think that's a little bit more tricky, at least when you're in person, you can keep uh, all three of them in sight, uh, but uh, somehow when you're doing it virtually, um, you 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 that that becomes a little a little harder uh, to do. So that maybe that's just a matter of getting getting used to it. I think, as Basil said earlier, virtual hearings are here to stay, except that perhaps uh, when it comes to witness hearings, um, I, I I suppose people will uh, continue to prefer. Um, at least as, as advocates and perhaps as tribunals, that opportunity to see people in person uh, and to uh, uh, get a better sense of them, their character and demeanor. But for an EA hearing where it really is unlikely to turn on, I mean, it should not be turning on contested uh, witness uh, testimony at all. Um, in fact, uh, in, in a typical EA, I don't think you would really be having uh, oral, uh, or, oral testimony. I think it works, it actually works, uh, works very well. Um, I did want to add one point, um, which I think might be helpful, sort of going back a little bit in the discussion, but I, I, I do think, you know, the, the, the shortcoming, uh, unfortunately for an EA application, there, there are some shortcomings. Um, and uh, one of those is that um, if you need to, um, enforce your order against third parties. If third parties are involved, um, it's really uh, not terribly effective taking it through an EA because you're going to have to end up in, a, in, a, in court anyway. And so to the extent that that's possible, uh, it may be preferable to go straight to court. Uh, I think Buzzell mentioned uh, urgency um, as another issue. And I think there's also the issue of notice uh, in arbitration and in the EA, you have to um, give everyone notice, uh, but sometimes in an urgent injunction situation, uh, particularly when we're talking about dissipation kind of injunctions, um, that really is is uh, is going to make it ineffective. So um, there are some limitations as well, but I definitely think that in terms of the form and the format, uh, virtual hearings are going to be a very important tool uh, going forward. Thank you, Philip. So since we've discussed from the application 
of an EA to the process to the hearing. Maybe we have to go to the crucial side, which is some enforcement of the order or the award. So maybe Ms. Trina has any experience or maybe um, she could give us any points of consideration in Philippine domestic law with regard to enforcement of the award slasher order. Um, everyone seems to say that the most important part of an arbitration relief is the ability to enforce it. And um, for obvious reasons, um, if you are in a private forum such as arbitration, you don't have the teeth to bind third parties. You don't have the teeth to compel parties who, to the arbitration to abide. Um, so for purposes of enforcement within the Philippines, if there are EA orders or awards that you seek to enforce, um, although internationally there's some inconsistency of whether you can enforce it cross-border, whether it's covered within the contemplation of the New York Convention, in the Philippines at least, I think there is an, we are at that point that arguments can be made for and against. Um, the Philippine law legal landscape is such that EA is, doesn't appear in any of our law books. It has not been mentioned at all in the Supreme Court rules. And there is yet no Supreme Court decision on any emergency arbitration award or order. So the silence of the law can be a source of flexibility and we can use that to our advantage. At the same time, it can be a source of uncertainty on the part of the parties and as well as um, it can cause delay. Um, but if you want to enforce it, I think Dawn already mentioned this earlier, that there is a way to do it by avoiding the New York Convention altogether and saying an EA award or order is actually an interim measure, an interim relief. And the Supreme Court rules in the Philippines allows parties to go to the courts to ask the assistance in enforcing the emergency or interim relief. And um, this, uh, you can fashion that argument and hopefully the court will appreciate it as an interim relief. Don mentioned that another institution in the Philippines actually says that categorically, that the EA award or order is an interim measure of protection, that amounts to an interim measure of relief that can be enforced. So using the Supreme Court rules, you can enforce. And I think you can take that argument. Um, but yes, it will all depend on whether because of the silence and the lack of guidance um, from the Supreme Court at this time, you, it will be dependent on the appreciation of the specific court before you, you are at. So if the commercial court does not believe that it is an interim measure, will apply the New York Convention instead and say it's not an award within the contemplation, it will not get enforced. But if it considers it an interim measure, it, will, it can have that ability to enforce. But I think behind all that, the one thing that you can rely on in the Philippines is that we are a pro-arbitration country. Uh, as Bazun mentioned, we are also a court subsidiary model country. So um, it gives a lot of um, leeway to the tribunal. And the Supreme Court rules specifically say, if there's a scenario we did not contemplate, then you look to the law on our ADR, you look to the rules and give effect to its intent. And the intent is to have arbitration or ADR as an efficient tool. And it won't be efficient if you cannot enforce the awards or orders or relief given by an emergency arbitrator or the tribunal. So I think you can rely on that for purposes of fashioning that argument. As Don Mark said, it is being tested and hopefully eventually we'll have guidance from the Supreme Court. But at the moment, the silence is good. The silence is good for us who are advocates of ADR. You can make that argument and say it. And um, until the Supreme Court says otherwise, that will be my pitch. We can enforce an emergency arbitrator award here in this country as an interim measure of protection. Um, of course, it's easiest if the parties just agree 
and obey. But uh, I don't know, perhaps Philippine parties are not as worried about the negative inference. So they're not as um, uh, easy to make uh, abide by an emergency arbitrator award. But um, perhaps this is something we should consider. If you, your contract is with the Philippine party, or for any, any jurisdiction, you may want to put in, in your arbitration clause from the beginning that um, if there is non-compliance with an award issued in an emergency arbitration, the EA can provide in its award certain consequences, such as fines or penalties that should be added on to the award eventually, just so that from the beginning, there's already an incentive to obey. So you don't have to go through the enforcement process in part. But eventually, if you need to enforce it in the Philippines against third parties particularly, then the Philippines, at the moment, allows it. Thank you, Ms. Rina, for giving us the nuance for the enforcement of these measures. Especially, um, for example, our experience in SIAC for the EA awards or order, it's usually voluntarily complied by the parties. But I understand your sentiment that it's not necessarily the case for Filipino parties. So it is good that you were able to suggest to our participants that maybe in the drafting of the contract, this should be considered already to begin with. So we have around four minutes left. I have one question from the um, audience asking if it will be allowed to, uh, for example, there's a provision in the contract prohibiting one party from availing interim relief or measures. Will, will this still be allowed by uh, the court or an arbitral institution? So would anyone from the panel would want to answer this? For example, it's already spe specified in the contract that you cannot um, go get um, interim measures. Um, if I can take First job at that. Uh, if, if it's just one party, uh, again, under Philippine law, a par parties are allowed to enter into stipulations provided they are not contrary to law, public policy, morals, good customs. That is an express provision of the Philippine Civil Code. And I think that's more or less a concept that is also recognized internationally. Yeah. So to the extent that it prohibits a party, because the question was, if it's just a party being prohibited, then that, to me, appears to be a, a clear violation of the mutuality of contracts. Um, and to the extent, of course, that there are facts and circumstances that will explain why that was entered into, then, then I guess it can also go either way. Uh, but if one can establish that the recourse to an emergency arbitrator for interim relief is something that is necessary or goes into due process, justice, etc., such that that violation can actually be attacked on the basis of being contrary to law, good policy, etc. Then, at least from the perspective of Filipino, that that can be. But again, I, I I would differ if it were both parties being prevented, in which case both parties had already agreed not to uh, apply for interim measures or emergency relief. So, in which case, that may be a harder argument to run. So, does anyone else from the panelists want to add? on Mr. Louis's answer. Um, hi, Thea. Uh, just to add to, to what Louis said, maybe um, on, on the assumption that both parties have agreed um, not to um, uh, avail of interim measures, then I think we might as well make a distinction between the tribunal and the courts. I think for the tribunal, then obviously their agreement will be binding because the jurisdiction of the tribunal and the EA depends on their agreement. But with respect to a court application for interim measure, it may be less categorical, uh, even though they have um, uh, agreed not to apply for interim or provisional remedies, the court may override that agreement depending on the situation. So because uh, the court's jurisdiction will not be by virtue of the agreement of the parties, but by law. So yes, I think that's, that's a distinction that should be taken by. Thanks very much, Don, for that. So I think this is all the time that we have for this afternoon. And I'm very grateful for our panelists for taking the time, despite your busy schedules, to join us for the SIAC Philippines webinar. I certainly learned a lot, and I hope that our audience participants were able to learn a lot from you as well. So on behalf of the SIAC and the panelists, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. This video webinar will be on the website 
and YouTube channel of SAAC, then you may also um, answer the feedback form after this Zoom meeting has ended. So thank you very much to our panelists and the audience for participating. And you can watch more webinars from the SAAC in the upcoming days and weeks. So thank you. And I hope you have a good afternoon and evening. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.